to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and uh, hopefully you didn't sense that we did that last second right there. You probably did because of me, but uh, Brother Josh just texted me about 15 minutes ago. He's not feeling well, and so we were trying to make sure we had stuff covered this evening. I don't know if singing with me this morning made him sick, and so he's out of commission. I may have that effect on folks, but uh, pray for, I don't know, we're having an odd wave of flu and kind of cold-like stuff, and it doesn't feel like it should be that time of the year. But to pray for those, I don't know if that's the case for Brother Josh. First Samuel chapter 1 tonight, we're beginning a new series looking at this book and what it teaches us about influence, specifically godly influence. And so we're looking forward to studying uh, this book together. And we're going to begin in chapter 1. And uh, let's stand together if we're able to do so for just a moment. We'll read just a few verses, uh, beginning in verse Number one, First Samuel chapter one. Let's begin in verse one. Now there was a certain man of Ramoth Amim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. All right. If you have any issue with those pronunciations, you come up here and read that verse. All right. Verse two, and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. The name of the other is Peniah. And Peniah and her children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship, to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And, two, uh, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. When the time was that Elkanah, uh, Elkanah offered, um, he gave to Peniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters a portion. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. Notice at the end of verse 5. But the Lord had shut up. Her womb. And so I want to begin tonight by looking at influence in its genesis and its beginning. So tonight we're going to look at the origin of influence and specifically how God raised up this man Samuel and all of the miraculous components of that. So I ask the Lord to help us this evening as we study this new book. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the privilege to gather tonight. Um, thank you for even the flux and changes and things last minute that, that we just, it's just part of the ministry. Thank you even for those things. And just uh, the joy it is to serve you and uh, all that that means. I pray, Father, tonight as we gather that you be with several families that are out this evening with illness and other burdens and challenges. Just encourage them tonight. Uh, help us to be a blessing to them as you give us opportunity. Thank you for the privilege to meet tonight. Thank you for a building with air conditioning and uh, just a place to come in out of the heat and to hear from your word and to allow you to stir in us deeply. I pray as we begin this new study of First Samuel as we move from some of the other things we've been emphasizing of worship and now uh, and from the book uh, study that we've just been in Ephesians, and now as we turn to this book of 1 Samuel, that, Lord, you would work in our hearts, that you would stir us deeply, that we can be um, high-impact kind of influencers for you, not just the dads, but every one of us, with our young people included. And I pray, Father, that you would convict us and challenge us on that front. Help us to encourage others, Lord, that are emerging as new leaders in your work and in your will. Um, help us to partner with them. Bless this study. Be honored how it's preached, how it's heard, how uh, each of us applied in our lives this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated this evening, the question, the age-old question as it pertains to leadership, I don't know how you feel about leadership. Um, I'm a leader. You may think I am a leader. I like to boss people around or whatever your, your mindset of leadership is. Or maybe I'm not a leader. Um, but the question has always been, are leaders born or are leaders made? Um, and I would give you just a brief antidote that I think kind of answers that question, um, and I think maybe can challenge each of us that we can be a part of leadership and influence. Um, this story has been around for years. I don't know of its veracity in every detail, but there's a story of a group of American tourists uh, who were in a quaint little English village and just enamored by the winding... Uh, cobblestone streets and all of the ambiance of this city, uh, the beauty of its courtyards, its plazas, and just a sense of history just emanating from all of these ancient buildings that were around them. So as they were walking through the town, this, this very quaint, old, uh, ancient city or town, um, the tourists struck up a conversation with an older gentleman who was there um, leaning against one of the half walls in the city, in this village, and uh, they found he lived in the town. Uh, in fact, he had lived there his entire life. And so one of the Americans, eager to kind of engage and to learn more about the town's history, asked the following question. He said, Sir, have any great men um, been born in this village? 
Have any great men been born in this village? Older man paused for a minute and said, nope, they all were born as babies. And can I just say this evening that leadership is not as much an intrinsic quality. I know there are certain giftings and personalities, but every leader in large part is a made leader. And we see the beginnings of that. We see the origins of that found in 1 Samuel. This man that the book is named after, um, his beginnings were very humble beginnings, very desperate beginnings, and yet God used him to do great things for his glory. And I think one of the primary hindrances of why we're not seeing a new generation of leaders being raised, at least at the scale and at the pace that I think maybe we did in days gone by, is that we miss the beginning point of leadership. Um, if I were to ask you tonight, who's somebody you see as an emerging leader um, on the home front? Who's somebody you see as an emerging leader, spiritually speaking? Do you know that person? Have you begun to see some of those fledgling uh, potential and tendencies in their life and in their heart and the gifting of God, uh, maybe even in your children? And so we need to learn to recognize these early signs of leadership and development. We need to, we need to cater. We need to do our best to encourage those uh, baselines of leadership and to build them into what God would have them to be built into. Now, as I was reading and prepping for this book study, in some of the early compilations of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and 1 Kings, 2 Kings, they actually were labeled 1 Kings, 2 Kings was 1 and 2 Samuel. And some places they're found then the books of 1 and 2 Kings were 3 and 4 Kings, the way that they were coupled together. You do know that the, cat, the breakdown of some of the chapters and the labels are not uh, inspired in the same sense as the text of the book. Um, and you will see there even the heading of the book says otherwise, at least it should in your Bible, the first book of Samuel, otherwise called the first book of the kings. So this, this book is so important to the leadership of Israel. I don't know about you, I tend to start with, with Saul, if I'm thinking just from a human standpoint when it comes to leadership in those early days of leadership and the uh, the nation of Israel, or maybe I even go to David, but it began here in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel. Um, and this would be the beginning of this theme, as we've called this series, He Reigns, the sovereignty of God and His sovereignty being manifested through the leaders He has called to serve and guide His people. And basically, the story of 1 Samuel, if I had to boil it down, it would be this, it would be the story of how one man, how one godly man changed a nation um, and we are still feeling the effects of his leadership even uh, to this day. So the question tonight is, when, where should we look to pick up on a new leader or a new direction in which God is wanting to include our influence? How can we see someone who God is working in their heart? How can we encourage them? Maybe something new God has called us to do and be for him. How do we perceive that in its original uh, beginnings? All right, let's talk about tonight two ways or two origins found in this text from which comes a leader that God is going to use uh, mightily. And if you're taking notes or outlines, I think uh, three or four pages in, I think it's right, maybe page four or so in your outline there or your bulletin. Number one, first of all, let's talk about that we see here in the text that in, <coughs> excuse me, influence begins with a human problem. Influence for God always begins uh, with a human problem. And we see that problem unpacked here in the first half of chapter one as God introduces this young man to answer and to solve a problem that was a part of this home and of this nation. Um, this past week there was an auction in, uh, uh, I'm not sure where it was located, I don't have it written down here, but the auction was of, it was some locks of, you remember a guy named General George Custer, have you heard that name? Um, stra uh, strands of hair from his head that have been retrieved and saved all of these years sold just a little clump of them for $12,000. What is General Custer known for? He is known for, known for what? The victory of Little Bighorn or the defeat, the absolute devastating defeat of the Battle of Little Bighorn? And it's just fascinating to me that here's a guy, he's known for the worst military move in human history, American history at least probably, um, and that his hair is being sold for great uh, amounts of money. Can I just say this evening that to embrace influence means we must start with the premise that God often allows problems, He allows voids, He allows deficiencies to then raise up a leader to fill that gap. Um, and we see that clearly indicated here in the story of Samuel. All right, so let's, let's talk about a few areas or problems that we see demonstrated here in this home that I think maybe we see in our day maybe in different fronts. 
Uh, the first problem we see listed in the first seven verses is the problem of barren desperation. Barren desperation. And if you will, please look back at the text. You will notice, as we read at the end of verse number two, one of Elkanah's wives had many children and the other, Hannah, had no children. Um, and so we see this barrenness uh, on the part of Hannah and the desperation uh, in her heart as she would, in just a few verses later, come before the Lord asking um, for his provision. All right, let me give you a couple areas of barrenness we see listed here in the text. First of all, jot this down, physical barrenness. In verse number one, we have Elkanah, who is an Ephraimite. Um, he is uh, living in Ramah, and uh, he has these two wives, and one of them, Hannah, as I just mentioned, is without children. There is a physical barrenness. Um, one of the indications of how lawless these days were is that he had two wives. Um, and nowhere does the Bible promote that, or it, it does give allowance for it as far as that God worked in the heart of Abraham, for example, and others who had two wives. But there was a lawlessness, there was a barrenness on the part of Hannah. She was loved but she was barren. Uh, go, if you will, now to verse number four. We've read this already, but you will notice that um, Hannah, he gives the extra blessing to. He encourages her, but notice the end of verse five, but the Lord had shut up her wound. This barrenness had been allowed by the Lord. And I don't know if we read over that verse, and for you ladies, you maybe have been through this season, or maybe you're currently in this season, but the barren womb is a, is a difficult burden to bear. Um, and Hannah, uh, in her culture, to not have children was actually a sign that God had cursed a family or cursed that lady or cursed the husband of that lady. And so it was a burden on her part that she carried with her every day, every moment, the barrenness that was a part of that. Can I just remind you tonight, whatever your physical barrenness, that our present shortage in any physical resources provides an opportunity for someone new to rise, to lead. Um, and I was thinking of Joseph. Um, I love that passage. You know, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, to save much people alive. The crisis of the famine, without that famine, would we have Joseph? And um, as you know, I read a, a lot on history. A lot of the crises in, in human history, without those, we wouldn't have the leaders that were raised during those seasons of difficulty. Uh, and so this barrenness was setting up for God to do something extra special in the womb and in the heart and in the life of this dear lady, Hannah. All right, now, just quickly, we'll come back to this, but look at verse 3. It says that Elkanah went up to his city, or out of his city, yearly to worship, to sacrifice. Notice, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Number two, it's alluded to here in verse 3. We'll come back to it in chapter 2, but there was also spiritual barrenness in this moment spiritual barrenness that created a void of leadership that Samuel was shortly to fill. And despite all of the corruption, and we'll study about it in chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, despite all the corruption of Phinehas and Hophni, um, Elkanah just kept going and worshiping. He stayed faithful to God even when the religious establishment of his day was corrupt, to say the least. He persisted in his worship of God. And may I say this evening, too often we allow our physical circumstances to affect our attitude toward God, our worship of God, and we see this family being faithful to God even in barren times. Their own physical deficiencies, the deficiencies of those in spiritual leadership, they persevered in their relationship with the Lord. And on this Father's Day, I would be remiss if I didn't say we need to persist for the next generation. We need to stay faithful to God. No matter how barren the religious or spiritual landscape is, we need to stay true to the God we claim to worship. There's something bigger going on than our tangible challenges. And I've noticed with leaders, they see that. Those who are followers, those who are sheep, they whine and complain and bleat about all of the challenges of their day. Leaders see the opportunity. Uh, and we see that long before Samuel came along, this dear couple saw and vi had a vision for God and his will uh, for their family. All right, now, if you will go back to the text to verse number 8. And notice the second problem that was faced by this family that you may be facing tonight that actually positions us for greater leadership. Verse 8, Then said Elkanah, uh, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee? than ten sons. All right, number two, the second problem that often leads to greater leadership is misunderstood motives. 
the problem of misunderstood motives. I, know I shared an excerpt this morning, but I was reading a, a list of stories submitted to the Reader's Digest uh, regarding fathers. Um, and one of the most humorous to me uh, was a lady. She uh, submitted this. She said, quote, in the frozen food section of our local grocery store, I saw a man shopping with his son. As I walked by, he checked something off his list and whispered conspiratorially to his son, you know, if we really mess this up, we'll never have to do it again. Um, have you ever been tempted to do something and your motives have not been the purest motives? Um, I think sometimes as we follow God's leading, our motives may be our question by others, and that is a sometimes just a necessary part of this transition to new leadership. You know, there's two areas of misunderstanding. First of all, in the family, you see that in verse 8. Uh, is Elkanah tried to console Hannah, figures a guy tries to solve it with food, you know, or tries, you know, his insensitivity and am not I, this amazing husband that I am, am I not much better than 10 sons, missing the whole burden and challenge of her uh, day-to-day existence. I may remind you that our families, often we will be misunderstood when we're leading out, out as God, God would call us to. to. Jesus reminds us of that in Luke 2 and verse 49. Remember, he goes to the temple and they can't find him and he says, um, How is it you sought me, wish you not that I must be about my father's business, God's business? Mark chapter 6 and verse 4, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. And so we have to be okay with sometimes misunderstandings with family uh, to follow God's leading in uh, our own heart and life. All right, now go to verse 9. Notice the second area that sadly occurred of misunderstanding as Hannah opened up her life to God's leadership. Look at verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. This would be the father of the two gentlemen referenced in verse 3. And she was in bitterness of soul, and that carries a very strong connotation to it, and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, And remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. It came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Notice, if you will, now verse 13. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, notice this, Eli thought she had been drunken. Number two, jot this down. Not only are we misunderstood by family, but often by religion. When we follow God's leading and He begins to answer the problem of our day, we are often misunderstood by religious uh, individuals. First of all, you notice her bitterness of soul is misunderstood. Hannah's pouring out her heart to God, and yet this man watches her and passes judgment upon her. What I find striking in verse number 10 is it says, and she was in bitterness of soul, and then what does she do? And then she prayed. She prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Hannah's despair drove her closer to the Lord, her misery in it. She trusted in God's grace. She trusted in God's provision. This is key tonight. Godly leaders always draw closer to God and become more committed to his purpose in difficult times. They don't pull back from God. They don't abandon his mission and purpose. They draw nearer to it. Um, They they see it as more significant and more important in tough times than in the convenient times. And the responses we see in this uh, lady Hannah that would be transferred to her son, the responses of her soul, are what positions each leader to have an impact and an influence. Anybody can whine and complain and quit, but it's those who persevere during tough times. Those are those that God uses to lead in his purpose and plan. What are you doing when it gets tough? How are you modeling this same spirit we see in Hannah and the difficulties you may be facing this evening? All right, and then you see not only the bitterness of her soul, but the plea of her soul. She begs God in the verse we just read. She's pouring out her heart to the Lord. Notice verse 14, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be uh, drunken, put away thy wine from thee? And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong uh, drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaining grief have I spoken hitherto. And so she cries out to God, and again, her motives are questioned by the priest Eli. 
Um, I think this indicates here that back in this day, quiet prayers or silent prayers was almost unheard of in this setting. And Hannah almost was, was a pioneer in that. She was one of the first we see recorded in Scripture to pray before God in a quiet manner. And Eli misinterpreted that and misapplied that and passed judgment upon her motivations. Can I just say tonight, godly leadership does not begin with the tangible externals. It begins in the soul. It begins in the heart. It begins inside of us. An authentic relationship with God always precedes authority before men. And we see this authenticity in the heart of this dear woman. Notice what Eli says in verse 17. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Verse 18, and she said, let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Do you see again the return of faith? She goes back to eating. She believes her prayer will be answered. And so we see the spirit uh, that Hannah models there. When is the last time you were joyful about something before God did it? Um, I love to talk to people who have had God answer prayers, but I really like to be around people who talk about the answer before he even gives it. See the faith there of Hannah? Leaders have faith. Not faith that, let me list five reasons why I believe God that I've seen him do something. Let me give you things I know he's going to do. Here's things I'm trusting him with. Here's things I'm anticipating. And we see Hannah exhibiting that, uh, that mindset and that spirit in her response to this situation. Um, Dad's been here this afternoon a bit. And we were just working, trying to talk through some of the phase two. He does some reno and building things and um, it's been a help to me through all these phases we've been in. And um, I've noticed in building things, like even the building we're in now, like this is a miracle, you know that, just what we have tonight. Those of you who have been with us for a while know that. Um, and I was reading an article a few months ago that was quoting J, uh, James, uh, James Hudson Taylor, J. Hudson Taylor. And he said this, There are three stages to every great work of God. First, the first stage is it's impossible. The second stage is it's difficult. And then the third stage is it's done. It's impossible, it's difficult, it's done. And those who know those phases and see through those phases are the ones who lead, not those who after it's done say, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. That's not a leader. Um, that's a follower. Uh, a leader has a vision. A leader sees it before God does it. And so we see Hannah exhibiting faith, being a leader herself, and that will lead to her son being a great leader for the Lord. All right, so influence begins with a human Problem. Now, let's spend a few minutes in the last section of this chapter. Secondly, influence begins, its origins are found in a divine solution. Influence begins with a divine uh, solution. I think I've shared this once before, but have you ever noticed, I know I'm going to get myself in trouble with my dad being here, but have you noticed that sometimes dads, their sense of style is a bit off? My boys sometimes will say stuff to me or others will. Um, I'm a bit colorblind, so just that gets me in trouble at times. The other day I heard again, someone said this years ago, said you can tell what was the best year of your father's life because they seem to freeze that clothing style and just ride it out to the sunset. You know, it was the best year of their life and I'm going to wear this suit because it's my lucky suit and, or whatever, you know, the jeans that I love or whatever the case may be. Um, and uh, the sense of style that uh, maybe is out of style. Um, can I say tonight that influence begins with the belief that God's power and God's solutions are not just for a bygone era? Do you believe tonight that God can do something tonight, that he can fix the problems we face? He can change the narrative in whatever you're facing this evening. Leaders believe that God can solve things now, not just in the good old days, not just someday in glory, but today, tomorrow, uh, this week. All right, a couple things about that in the area of solution. First of all, look at verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, notice, and the Lord remembered her. Number two, or the first aspect of this influence that begins with a divine solution, number one, is the solution of an answered prayer. The solution of answered prayer. Now, I want to ask you very directly this evening, do you believe, do you believe right now that God still answers prayer? Do you believe that? And does your prayer life exhibit that conviction? When's the last time you prayed and before you even began, you said, God, I know you already know the cry of my heart. You know what's on my heart. And I already believe you're going to do this. I know you can do this. I know you're willing to do this. If it's within the frame of your purpose and plan, you are able to answer my prayer. 
Hannah saw God solve a problem through answered prayer. Notice two aspects of this answer. Number one, she was remembered by God. And we see that in verse 19. And the Lord remembered her. The birth of this child was not by chance. It was the deliberate intervention and action of God. Um, As he responded to her faith, as he honored her prayer, and as he was then through that answer going to accomplish his will for um, his people. When God remembers his people who have chosen to forget him, he always raises up a leader. God does not remember his people in abstract ways. When he remembers his people, he gives us leaders. Um, You can go through the narratives of times where God remembered his people. I'll give you just a couple of them. Joseph, as I mentioned earlier, Moses, he said, I've heard the cry. And he sent a deliverer from the backside of the desert. Now Samuel, and the list goes on and on of God remembering his people and then sending a leader their way to deliver them. All right, verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name, notice this, his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. Number two, not only is she remembered by God, she is heard by God. The name Samuel, you could jot this down because this is a key part of our study in the book of Samuel. Obviously, it means heard of God. She asked and God heard. And the answer to the hearing was she gave to this dear lady this child. He was the answer to her prayer. Now, I just want to encourage you because I think the temptation is to read this and say, yeah, but I'm not Hannah. Was it the prayer of Hannah or was it the answer of God that made this story special? I'm sure other ladies prayed the same prayer Hannah prayed. I'm sure other ladies that begged God and asked God for things. It was the answer of God. It was his answer to her prayer that made this significant. So the solution to our problems is the answer God gives to our prayer. Those who want to get in on the ground floor of what God is doing first know that their prayers have influence with God. They know God listens. They know God responds. And therefore, they submit and offer their prayers to the Lord. Um, I have learned this. I'm still learning this in my life. I tend to sometimes be a fatalist where whatever will be, will be. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. But God has said there are things I will not do until you pray. There, there are people, that, and maybe you're praying for your young people, or you're praying for someone that you're influencing, and you must pray for them before God will uh, enable them and position them to rise up and be an influencer for His glory. And so may we pray, may we pray, may we pray that we might be remembered by God and that we might be heard by God. All right, now notice the response of this family beginning in verse 21. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer in the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said, <laughs> excuse me, under her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. Number two, jot this down, not only the solution of answer prayer, that's God's responsibility. Number two, the solution of sacrificial consecration. And this is our responsibility, to be sacrificially consecrated before the Lord. It's interesting that once Hannah had the child, they didn't forget about God. They they remembered their commitment. They remembered what they had promised God, and they were going to follow through on what they had committed to the Lord on question I would ask you tonight is, are you willing to follow through on the consecration, the calling that God has asked of you? Are you willing to do what he has asked you to do? Sometimes when God solves a problem, we forget him. Instead of being as faithful to him after he's answered that prayer and he's followed through on his promises in our lives, and even in that, we must stay faithful to him. Um, There's an interesting story in the news, I think it was two weeks ago, Domino's, I don't know what your preference on pizza is. My boys would eat pizza every day three times a day if they could. They laugh at me when I find out they had pizza like three times in a row. They just think that's like they're taking over the world or something. And so we have that little give and take about pizza. But Domino's Pizza, they're always doing these kind of flake. We had, uh, when we lived in Michigan there in Ann Arbor, you would drive by their main headquarters uh, on, uh, what road would that be? Going north into Michigan anyway on the right there. And their new thing is they're actually paving potholes. And they've got this uh, it's just a publicity stunt, but they announced on Monday a week ago that they're trying to save pizzas one pothole at a time by filling potholes 
um, that lead to cracks, bumps, uh, and other damage to good pizzas who are at risk between order and delivery. And they have, a, they have uh, rollers that roll the asphalt. They have trucks all with their logos on it. And so you can submit your city online, and then they'll send their trucks out. It's a big publicity thing. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, the lengths we go to protect things. Would you agree that often it is we who already are leading that provide the greatest potholes to the next generation of leaders? We say one thing and we do another. Uh, we claim to believe God. We claim to submit to his lordship in our lives, and yet we trip them up. We discourage them, and Samuel didn't have that in his family. Just as important as God answering the prayer was that the family that received the answer to that prayer was committed to that God who had answered the prayer, and it led to this young man being uh, engaged in service for the Lord. All right, a couple areas we see them exhibit this. Number one, look in verse 21 to 23 we just read. Jot this down. First of all, there was selfless preparation. Selfless preparation. Hannah and Samuel did not accompany Elkanah as he went every year. They didn't go for these first few years as she raised him and prepared him to be in service to the Lord. Um, she didn't want him to be a liability, but to be able to function and survive without her immediate care in his life. And so they continued to prepare to follow through in what God had called them to do and be. Leaders humbly recognize that though God gives them something, ultimately it's only on loan. I notice often leaders tend to manipulate those they follow. They tend to control them. Um, it's a tendency that all of us that are kind of strong-willed, we domineer, we overwhelm, and try to manage and, and, and direct people in our desires. And yet this family saw that Samuel was not theirs. He was the Lord's, and they had to be faithful to manage and steward him properly. Um, just a question tonight for those of us that tend to do that with our children and grandchildren. If God can't come to our kids and raise the next generation of leaders for the cause of Christ, what homes is he going to come to? What families is he going to come to? They're not ours. We know that, correct? Where are the next generation of leaders going to come if they don't come from your kids and mine, your grandkids, and someday, Lord willing, mine? It is something we must be faithful to, to be open and willing to prepare young people and leaders for the mission God has for them. All right, look at verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. Imagine what's going through her heart and mind at this point in the narrative. With three bullocks and one ephah, a flower and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. It's interesting, that's there. Verse 25, and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. Number two, jot this down, the area of consecration. First, there is selfless preparation. Number two, there is willing follow-through. Willing follow-through. Um, I don't know how much you're familiar with adoption, and you're familiar with um, maybe someone not able to care for a child and giving that child up for adoption, but often a birth mother at the last minute will renege on their commitment to put that child in a home that can better provide for it. Hannah could have had misgivings. She could have pulled back. She could have drawn back from this commitment, but she followed through on what she had committed to the Lord. The language seems to indicate both earlier and here that he was a Nazarite. For the rest of his life, he was a Nazarite. Um, a commitment, not just for a period of time, but for his life. He was to be a consecrated gift and sacrifice and a leader for the Lord, surrendered to his will. Um, and so we see this pledge being followed through on Hannah's part. Um, can I give you two applications maybe to think about where maybe you go to an extreme on this uh, of being a flawed leader toward new leaders that God is raising maybe in your home or your realm of influence? Um, first mindset would be we tend to approach other, especially young people, as just get out of my hair, just get out of my, get out of my space. Instead of realizing that our job is to help them discover and to surrender to God's will for their life. That is our responsibility. When's the last time you've asked God, God, give me wisdom on how to lead my children, how to lead others in my, my life to, to, to follow God's will and help them discover exactly what he wants for them. And I, I just ask this directly to you. What, who is leading for the cause of Christ today that you've mentored? 
Who is, who is on the mission field? Who is on target in their family? Who is walking with God? Who is in the Word? Who is winning souls as a result of your influence? We need your partnership in that. You need me. I need you. God needs us to have that vision. Secondly, the second extreme would be to stay as close to me as possible. This would be the exact opposite. We keep them close to control them. When again, lovingly, I remind you, your job is to let go of trying to control them and to teach them that you fully support God's will being done in their life, however that affects you, whatever that looks like, yielding them to the Lord to be a leader that God would want them to be. Um, it was interesting as I was settling into this text and just getting familiar with the book at a, at a, a larger depth or a deeper uh, understanding and one of the commentators said this in reference to the book of 1 Samuel. He was working through where 1 Samuel is quoted in the New Testament. And he said this, Luke, John, Mark, Paul, and the writer of the book of Hebrews quote or allude to 1 and 2 Samuel. It's interesting that of the 18 references to these books, 1 and 2 Samuel, in the New Testament, almost all of them emphasize God's accomplished salvation through Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Not one reference is used to establish or even rehearse a historical fact or an event from the lives of Samuel, Saul, or David. The inspired New Testament writers undoubtedly viewed the whole Old Testament as salvation history, and their references would remind us to emphasize what is Christocentric about Christ in our interpretation of the material. So all of 1 Samuel and the leaders in it were really just the preparatory uh, uh, steps that would lead to the Messiah. 1 Samuel's not about Samuel. 1 Samuel's about Jesus Christ. Your kids and my kids are not about their proper names or ours. It's about Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And to raise leaders that are leading the way God wants, that must be what is at the forefront of our mind and hearts. All right, as we finish today, look, if you will, back at verse number 5. And I know I emphasize it a bit as we read it. But look again, if you will, at it for just a moment. Verse number 5. <clears throat> the end of verse 5 says, Unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But notice the end of verse 5, But the Lord had shut up her womb. Hannah's barrenness was due to God's sovereignty. Is that true? God caused that. Now go to the very last verse. We, we held off on reading it until here at the end. Look, if you will, at the end of verse 28. So God was behind the barrenness, the problem. But notice that verse 28. After saying he will be lent to the Lord as long as he liveth, notice the end of verse 28, and he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah's barrenness was due to God's sovereignty, and that sovereign plan that included the birth of this child ultimately got glory for God through this new leader. Who could be worshiping God? Who could be leading for the cause of Christ if we would see leadership as a primary responsibility that we have? My wife is homesick today, but she posted this picture of our son Landon, um, and she just put the caption, Sunday afternoon cuddles. It's Landon, I think it's Landon, and our dog Mo laying on a blanket in the living room with a blanket on top of them. Is that right, Landon, I think? Um, now, when you look at the top of that head, not the one on the right, okay, let's not go there. Okay, dogs don't go to heaven. Sorry for all of you out there. But the one on the left, that's my son Landon. He has potential, I think, for the Lord, Okay. And so does every young person we meet. But I think often we look at them and we don't see much difference between them and other things and other entities and even uh, other personalities. There is potential upon the head and shoulders and life of each individual. And are we stewarding our relationship with them and our influence in their life the way we see Hannah and Elkanah doing with this young man, Samuel? Now, I want to give you a statement and we'll finish. An author I was reading said this, he said, I meet more and more kids that don't know how to talk to people and who don't even want to look up from their screens. That's a pet peeve of mine, uh, mobile devices. He said this, we are raising soldiers. We are raising missionaries. Our job is to get these kids where they can get into the world and start conversations with people and bring the light of Jesus and the message of the gospel to them. Now, that may be a little bit of a sidebar. We could go on that for a while this evening, that, that application. But we are raising leaders we're not raising sheep, we're raising leaders. Uh, and those leaders that need to be raised and mobilized are the ones that we're raising right now. They're ones that need to be impacted to be, as Samuel was, a high-impact kind of leader for the cause of Christ. Here's the question, and we're done. Will you be aware of where God is originating influence in your life as you look for human problems that God's trying to solve through new leaders? 
and as you look for divine solutions through the people that he's mobilizing in your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you.